Let's go. A bit early, but let's start. Uh, I know, it, it looks like two ugly old guys and, and two <laughs> ladies. I, I know it's, it's, it looks weird, right? But uh, will be fun. Oh, well, thank you for coming. Uh, looks like uh, the topic is interesting. Uh, for us, it's a very exciting topic, actually. Uh, so we're trying to, to explore here in this panel is you know, what changes and what doesn't change in the, in the leadership models and the leadership skills for the next maybe 10, 15 years. Uh, I'm, I'm not giving you the rant when the world is changing and, and everything. I think if you guys are here, you already know that. I think the only thing that actually is changing is the pace of change itself. Right? So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's changing so exponentially that you know, consumers, customers' expectations are also following. So change is accelerating and challenging the models that we have, like right? what worked in the past, uh, apparently is not gonna work in the future. Right? So, and that's what we're here to explore with uh, three great minds, uh, three uh, very different companies, and we will explore the differences and how they're tackling the challenge. Uh, I will ask them to introduce themselves, and then I will hit them with questions. So please, Swan. Hi, everyone. My name is Swan Sit. I hope you guys can hear me because I'm losing my voice. I think we all have the South by flu by now. <laughs> um, I've been doing digital transformation in the beauty industry for the past 10 years, helping 100-year-old legacy companies move into the digital age. I actually recently left and switched to another brand, another category. It's um, the largest sportswear sneaker company in the world. Begins with an N, ends with an E. Um, but I'm really excited to be here because I think what we're talking about today is agnostic of the size of your company, the industry you're in, and what products you make. It's about people. And so I'm excited to be here to share some thoughts. Rob? Hi, everyone. I'm Rob Charter. Um, I've got the funny accent on the, on the stage. So. so I don't have a funny accent. <laughs> no, 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 not so I'm from New Jersey. <laughs> um, I'm a group president with Caterpillar, so we're a 90 three-year-old company, and uh, so we've got an interesting conundrum of how do we take a B2B business that's been around 93 years and adapt to um, the digital age, and, and what does that mean, and how do we manage through that while being successful, but maintaining our success and, and uh, making the change. So it's an interesting discussion. Sure. Yeah. Lizzie. Yeah, hi everybody. Lizzie Woodhelm. I'm from Pandora. I lead ad product innovation, and I also lead training and enablement for our 800 sort of person revenue and sales um, operations workforce. And I'd say that I'm excited to be here in terms of um, learning from two great minds, but also to bring what it's like to be at a startup. I've been at Pandora for 12 years, and grow up and do so with some structure and um, you know some process and some thinking that allows us to scale. Um, so I, I like that I have that experience that I can bring to this discussion. Cool. Which leads us to actually, I think the, the, the main thing that we're trying to explore here is the conflict between a speed and need for innovation, right? And the need for control, right? So it's a, if uh, anyone tried the, the VR race experience in the lounge, uh, it's like a, a Formula One experience, and it's very hard to actually control under high speed, right? So that's the... That's the balance, and I think it's that, that it has to be found, and I think it's leadership to actually find that balance, right? It's how to give the empowerment that our employees and our teams need to kind of feel uh, engaged and come with, their, with their, what they're seeing in the front lines, right? And give them power to actually go and, do, and implement their ideas with some structure, right? So that's the where to find that balance. Right? So with that, I really would like to understand from you guys, uh, because that, that's, I think that's the main difficulty, right? So it's how come to come to a culture, mainly traditional companies, and come from a, a, a place of uh, trying to optimize for predictability and risk avoidance, and how we come from that to innovate, 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 right? So, it's, uh, so that's the, that's the conflict, right? So if you guys can talk a little bit how your companies have been approaching Innovation, innovation in the, the role that uh, you see your leadership and the leadership of your companies uh, uh, approaching it. So it's, it's, it's innovation, you know, come from the teams, centralized, 
uh, how 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 have been the your experiences? One one wants to take that to take that one. I think innovation is more a mindset than a job description. And yes, there's certain roles and titles and budgets that are linked to innovation, but if you think that it can only come from a handful of people that are designated to do it, you're doomed to fail, right? Because no one said, as a company, let's invent the World Wide Web or let's invent Facebook, right? They're people with great ideas and it can come from anywhere. So you have to create a culture that allows people to speak up and not only rewards people for great ideas, but also celebrates when something is kind of silly, right? Because we all thought, Friendster was going to be the big social media platform. And you know we were all probably on our MySpace. And so we have to give ourselves room to learn and grow and pivot. And what I like about what you said about that VR, AR experience about driving, it's sort of similar to running a company, right? You kind of need to know where you're going, but you need to drive in real time and adjust, right? There's going to be road conditions. There's turnoffs and detours. And you might actually find a better destination along the way. You need to create a space, a vehicle with your passengers that you're open to listening and you're taking feedback, not just from yourself, but from everyone in the car, and then guiding that ship along the way. But it's not easy, right? Because you still have to run your day job. You have a P&L, you've got metrics, you've got all these numbers to hit. So the biggest challenge I see is actually not creating that culture as a whole company, because I don't think it's a one, it's not a single task. It's as a leader, as a business leader, going to your management and saying, these metrics are great because we have to run a business, but I need space to do these things. And if you're not going to allow me to be able to carve out time and space for innovation and creativity and small chances to fail, right? We're going to take smart bets, but actually, you have to let us actually fail. Everyone says, let's fail fast, fail cheap. But when you screw up, you get in trouble, right? At all these old just, companies. Just get you fired fast. Yes. <laughs> so if we can't say that and not give permission for people to do that. So as leaders in the company, we have to go to the executive team and say, give us time and space to do this. We'll take calculated risks. These are the things that we'll flag in a memo and be like, hey, this is a kind of risky thing. Here's our protocol. Here's contingency plans, B, C, D, et cetera, to give leadership comfort around the fact that you might be a big public company and take a risk. But if you don't do that with the upper management, then everything comes from the top and ladders down, and no one feels the ability to take risks and create. Cool. Rob, any particular strategies how you actually try to minimize the risk of failure, like a size of experiment? Yeah, I, I, using Australia as a as a as a lens to yeah, explore. Like yeah. where he told me Australia was her experiment. So if any of you guys want, <laughs> she just does it in Australia. Um, that was true, isn't it? That's yeah. close. Um, I, I think I think all your points are really um, accurate. I think it, it becomes when you want to do you've got to do experiments. You've got to celebrate failure, which is really hard, and that's one of the big cultural changes within an organisation. But then you've got to be able to build some swim lanes or guidelines to how you can experiment, is it business relevant, what level you can experiment to, and then how do you hit milestones and take it to new levels. So I agree completely that when you think about innovation, it's not a department in the company. It's, it is the mindset of the organisation, and it's a culture you want to drive. But you need to help the people work through that culture by actually having some real, really clear guidelines about how do we innovate? What's appropriate innovation? How do you scale it from a simple time off in your job to have some free time to think and come up with ideas right through to small experiments that take it all the way up to the board, mm -hmm. depending on, on the size of the experiment? So I think that's the important part. Lizzie, can, can you, uh, you were, were telling me back there that you actually have a culture that is, has a lot more speed than control, right? You work, work yeah. in your digital native company. It's not, an, a start, it's not a startup anymore, it's 2,500 people. So how I actually balance that, you know, that a lot of ideas and people coming up and, and, and you guys give a lot of autonomy to them to go and do their things. Can you explore it more actually how you control, how can we kind of yeah. put a little bit on the order? Yeah, I'd say, you know, we have um, sort of the exact opposite problem. We have so much great energy around innovation and everybody has great ideas. But we're still a small company, and we don't even have the luxury of a percentage of everybody's time freed up to um, think about fun stuff they'd want to do. So we need to put some constraints around um, how can somebody that comes up with an idea filter that immediately to understand if it's something that would um, sort of make it past the next step um, before there's any data, before there's an opportunity uh, to understand how it can make revenue. And so we're really customer-centric, and if it doesn't map back to solving something for our listener or our advertisers, 
and we have some very specific goals for both of those areas, it doesn't make it past that first point. And so everyone within our company can create a pretty simple brief against their idea. You don't need a full deck. You don't need to build out the entire market potential in terms of revenue, but you do need to be able to answer those, um, you know, how does your idea facilitate against those goals? And we're really transparent with those goals. We share them on our company meeting every single month. We have an employee meeting, and we're very clear and very consistent. And I think that does help our teams anticipate good ideas from bad ideas. Um, it doesn't mean that everything that then starts is successful. We, of course, to Swan's point, have checkpoints along the road. Um, but I'd say you know, that openness and transparency that we've created in terms of being very clear about what we're trying to solve for has helped put some constraint around um, that sniff test that someone can sort of do on their own. And other than the transparency, are, are you guys use any other tactics or tools to actually help to prioritize? Or do you have not only you, I guess everybody has the same, you know, problems of finite finite resources, right? So how you actually prioritize, you know, uh, yeah. where to allocate resources and, and what what the project will will be funded, and which will not? Yeah, we do some simple things, which I feel like my peers are gonna be mad at me for sharing this. But we have a meeting once a week, we call it the productive meeting. And that sounds funny because is every other meeting not productive? No. <laughs> but it has a very specific goal of in one hour quickly making sure that we're prioritized right week over week and allowing people to come and bring new information that might have happened in their respective area of the business because it's a cross-functional meeting. Um, and our competitive set is moving really fast. The music industry is moving very fast. The digital ecosystem specific to advertising is moving very fast. And we found that to be really helpful for us. And we deprioritize in that meeting all the time. I mean, if it's somebody's project, of course, they fight for why it shouldn't be deprioritized. But we all agree when we come out of that meeting that what we decided is happening, um, emotions or not, passion or not, and we make sure that we have um, an agreement amongst us. So that's worked really well for us, again, at the size of our operation. I don't know if, you know, Caterpillar, a 90-year-old business with thousands, I mean, what do you have, 50,000 employees or something insane? 100,000 employees? Like, I don't think you can have the productive meeting with six of you. <laughs> it's a very big room. Very, very, and a long meeting, right? It looks like the UN with everybody. Yeah. So what we do, I mean, it's a similar process, so it's just at levels. So when we have a, uh, we have some very segmented businesses, and within those at different hierarchy levels, um, and we don't have a lot of hierarchy levels, but within those you have certain scope where you can choose, as you said, as you've got a direct supervisor and a group of, of leaders, they can, they can um, scope out what they want to do exactly the same way. And then it, the really tricky part gets when you get into an executive office where we use an operating execution model. And, and what that's all about really is that prioritization across verticals, so where we have we have an um, energy business, we have a transportation business, we have a construction, a mining business, a marine. So when you start to look at all those, and they're all really important in their own, but you have a certain amount of dollars across the whole enterprise, then you have to make the hard decisions about where do you prioritise those dollars. And they're, they're, they're colourful meetings as well, but, but that's, that's, that's how you do it. But So it's a different level. I do digital transformation, so I'm the squeaky wheel. I'm the one who's always like, my projects are really important, right? So as part of the leadership team where everyone is more traditional parts of the business, I have to sell those ideas to them before we can even take it to our C-level suite. So my job is to sit down with each of them and say, for all these things we want to do, here's how it makes your life better. How it, here's how it makes your team better, your numbers better, the customers better. And if I don't do a good job of serving them almost as a client, then this project shouldn't probably be on our radars because if it's not achieving their goals or our company's goals, we're not on target. So one of the ways we always look at things is impact versus effort. And we've done a good job of redefining impact just for a long time, it's just sales or profit. And there's a lot of things in the digital space about engagement and acquisition that some are measurable, some are not. Things like lifetime value that takes years to prove out that you can't, you can't simplify into a single number. And we used to be able to do that more readily with a cost savings project or a revenue growth project. So when we look at this impact versus effort scale, sometimes something that may not be accretive really long term to the business, but 
For example, and this is kind of a dirty word, it's a PR impact, right? You do something really cool that gets a lot of buzz, gets a lot of attention, then you actually then cadence other more strategic programs behind it. There's impact around that. You just never want that to be a high effort type of project where you get a one-time blip. I mean, those work, right? I'm sitting here wearing my Westworld hat because I had so much fun at the experience yesterday. Now, that was not low, low cost, but the amount of media that they got from that is arguably better than they could have paid for. So when we look at the scale of impact versus effort, we've redefined effort, redefined impact. And then as a team, as a leadership team, we decide what we think is the most relevant before we even go to the C-level. So by then, it's signing off on a list of projects that we as a leadership team have agreed on versus I think sometimes companies get trapped into online versus offline. We're still battling. Who gets the media budget? Is it still TV and print? Is it more digital? How are we measuring things? How are we getting customers? We make sure we align in a more of an omni-channel way before we even go to that team. So we look as a uniform family. We actually help each other and think about, hey, Let's prioritize this here. Next quarter, we're going to do this. So it becomes less contentious, and we are more unified in a cohesive strategy because you want one plus one to equal three. You don't want two projects pulling in the wrong directions. Yeah, that, that's a great topic, like how you know, big companies are organized around silos, right? That's yep. functions. And uh, that doesn't, doesn't exactly help launch products very rapidly, right? So it, it requires tons of alignments and, and partnerships and, and time consumed, consumed by aligning vision, right? So, and, uh, and, and digital transformation is a topic that everybody whines and complains, and oh, there's not, this can be done uh, without a, a mandate from the CEO and like a very high app. So, but uh, I, I don't want people to come out of here and say there's nothing to do. Without a CEO mandate, we can do anything, right? So what in your experience, what can be done in terms of creating those alliances and, and relationships and partnerships to actually get things done without uh, your CEO getting it, right? So that's, uh, so what, what, what has worked for you guys? Can, can I make a comment? Just one sure. comment. We, we were working through, uh, and, and it's a difficult transition into digital. Um, we were working through with our organization for a long time, and it was always an argument, is uh, digital for us a PL? Is it not? Are we trying to sell subscriptions? Uh, are we, what, what are we trying to do with digital? And I think we made a breakthrough. Last year, we were spending a lot of time, and we've got some pretty cool stuff that we do um, from a technology point of view, but we're really trying to get a head around how do you for the prioritization. And it seems really simple, but once we came to a realisation that digital was purely an enabler to an outcome for a customer, um, things start to fall in line. And, and, and then the debate about the revenue is from our actual traditional way we, we, uh, we, we uh, gain revenue, which is selling equipment to customers and then supporting it with services and aftermarket support. And digital really just enables that and enhances that. Then the prioritisation became a lot easier for us. And it stopped you getting into this compete about, I'm just selling uh, digital for a subscription rather than actually making the customer successful. So it aligns you with your customers a lot better as well. And that was a big breakthrough for us. It sounds really simple, but it took a, it, 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 it smoothed out the arguments a little bit. But I think it's a good example of connecting to the question that if everybody's aligned with the customer, it's really easy to cross silos. Yeah. So if you all agree that you don't work for the CEO, but you work for the customer, I work for 90 million listeners. I don't work for our CEO. And I believe that, and so I want to build great products for them, and so do my peers. And so because we're aligned on that and wanting to build a really great music service and wanting to build ad products for, for Australia. Well, you know, you're an experiment down there. I told you. It's just a land of convicts, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know I love Australia, which is why the, it's like where we all want to live, right? I just want to have avocado toast and beer like all the time. Yeah. I've got your wallet, by the way. So. <laughs> but I, I, you know, um, we should we should really get a beer together. I love you. <laughs> Um, I, I, that really has helped us. And so, yes, of course, there's always going to be those moments where um, cross silos, I think you make a good point about getting consensus and treating the partners as your client. But that is what I love about our leadership culture is that we really do believe we don't work for the org chart, we work for our customers. And then in any moment of struggle, we always go back to, you know, what what's good for the listener is good for us. And that helps us to stay aligned and sort of unemotional 
because the data then tells us really quickly if we're doing our jobs. I don't need anybody that is in the C-level suite to tell me if I'm doing a great job. I can see it in terms of our audience growing or not growing and our advertisers buying or not buying. And that's how I try to center my team around uh, how they get out of bed every day. And that has helped. Yeah. So, so take note, elevate the customer actually needs above the yep. internal politics, right? So is there any kind of a technique or incentives or how your organizations have actually incentivized that behavior of the leadership, like uh, to kind of coalesce around the customer first, then internal battles? I kind of agree that the C-level, don't quote me on this, but kind of doesn't matter. They actually all say digital is important. Great, but it's <laughs> but it's the next Can't level down sure. that you, holds worry. the budgets. It's the next level down that holds the budgets and the day-to-day -day decisions. I've never had a problem with the C-level exec saying digital is mm -hmm. not important. I think we all get that, right? It's the next level down that day-to-day -day makes the decisions that's harder. So you talk about tactics and stuff. Let me give you an example. So on social, right, lots of different departments create content. So suppose you have a soft quarter in the land of beauty. Global marketing is like, red lipstick is classic. We should start promoting content around red lipstick. And then the e-com team is like, oh, nude lipstick, that's universal for everyone. So let's create a bunch of content around that. And then your US sales team is like, ooh, this palette's on sale at Ulta, so let's promote that. Then you've got your influencers going to Coachella, and they're doing this unicorn look. And then your trends and insights team is like, ooh, we need to be really daring with like new trends, so let's do blue sparkle lipstick. Then you've got your corporate social responsibility team saying, we need to do empowerment. These are all people running in six or seven different directions creating content that's all supposed to go live in one day. Like your consumer is so confused, right? <laughs> so go back to thinking about the consumer and their journey with your brand. What are touch points that they experience your brand first? Not just yours that you own, but a lot of us have retail partners we sell through, right? So if you're a Revlon or an Arden, most of your business is still coming from brick and mortar like Macy's and Target. So don't worry about who even with internally with silos and budgets is holding that relationship. You've got to also think about your retailers that are speaking on your behalf, their stores and their sites. So what we do is then we create an annual calendar that then we break down to quarters, that then we break down to weeks, then we even break down to days and times of day. And we actually, back to this point of treating internally everyone and our retail partners as our customers, we ask, what do we want to talk about this year? The big moments are Christmas, their Valentine's Day, their Mother's Day and beauty. Those are big gift giving holidays. Even New Year, New Year, New You, it's a very self-love holiday. We start calendaring all the different retail moments that we have to hit. Then we calendar all the different launches we have to do. We actually talk to all of our markets and regions. What are all the global things that we should be talking about? Don't even create the content yet. Let's create the roadmap for how we want to engage this discussion. Then we start parsing out what types of content happen where. And there's definitely a lot of wheeling and dealing, right? So you might be like, hey, two people want to do the same thing on the same day. We can't have that happen. So do we start bifurcating our content for different platforms and regions? Or do we say, hey, it's the Macy's one day sale. We're going to go big on that with Macy's because they're our biggest retail client. But next week, Ecom will run their friends and family, right? So there's a lot of moving of pieces. But that's the only way to guarantee everyone's on the same page. Because you can build relationships and be friendly. But if you're not helping your counterparts service their business, you're not going to get everyone on the same page. So we did this global calendar that, for the most part, we got everyone's needs on there. Then we created an, um, we worked with a, a digital agency to create all the content and all the different ways that everyone wanted. Then we pushed it out to all the different channels, the different markets, different departments, and even our retail partners. But if I under, understood correctly, you start with kind of overall your consumer and yeah. client journey, right? Yeah. So what's important for those people and trying to understand all the touch points and then kind of a we map backwards. where everybody would could contribute to that kind of overall overarching view. Right? Yeah. And I think it's important when you do that, how do you relate your employees' experience and their journey to the purpose of the organisation so that they, they can get a connection? We were talking a little, about this a little earlier about how do you make sure you're bringing your people with you? And, and, and you know, it doesn't matter how old you are, I think if, you, if you're building a, a purpose that's related to the, to the customers you're serving and people can feel that, then a lot of this innovation, a lot of this focus and alignment within the organisation occurs quite naturally. If you don't have that, then you're in hierarchy and you're in rules and, and then that's when you have problems. So yes. you've got to get that purpose and culture in alignment with your customer. Yeah. So th there, there's the old saying, right? So people join companies and leave managers, right? Exactly. So, yes. uh, exactly. 
So Lizzie, we're ta we're, we're, you're telling me like uh, some hard incentives to actually guarantee that people are aligned and focused on the customer, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, we do a lot of different things. Obviously, we pay people based on <laughs> like the easiest way to get everyone to do what you want them to do. Um, we pay people based on those outcomes, and some of that's easy. Obviously, a salesperson, it's very easy to set that. But even within non-sales functions, we do have a bonus system that's based on the outcomes of the business, not whether you're liked or not, not whether you've been there the longest. So I think that really does help. We also have a um, three moments in time, and I I'm curious actually for everyone in the audience, like what size company they're at, because it's hard. Makes I can, yeah. I mean, so, raise your hand if it's like I don't know what would be the under what? two thousand employees. Under two thousand. Okay, over ten thousand. Okay, startup. Okay, so it's middle and large. Um, when we were starting to get to the fifteen hundred mark, and we were starting to rapidly hire. Um, we created a function that is called playback and discovery, or it's a moment in time where managers meet with their employees about three times a year. Four times is a little too much. And in that, we want to hear your hits, your misses, your tone and tempo. That's like how you worked with people um, and your lessons learned. And that's been really a moment for us to get a temperature check and not necessarily reward monetarily, but have an opportunity to tell someone in the last 90 days, which is a nice sort of short window, you can execute just enough but not get too off track. What did you do? How did it perform? And it's just a candid conversation. It's not a formal, like, build this big PowerPoint. And I love that because it's allowed me to encourage the right behavior. And with my um, staff, many of them are in their 20s. So you know, yes, it can always be about money. But sometimes it's just like, you nailed this project. You did such a great job. These were the four takeaways that I think you need to put into the next, and here are two things that weren't working so well. And that's incentive in a different way for them to feel constantly coached and motivated. And so that's a bit of my leadership style is, you know, yeah, it'd be fine to just throw money at people, but that doesn't, not every business can do that. Um, yes, walk up music. Um, it, it's just those coaching moments that feel almost as good as, um, you know, a bonus. I'm glad you brought up leadership style because that's a big part of it for me too. I don't think it's always about money, right? It's certainly nice, but every company has bonuses and incentives. So how do you as a leader change and make an environment where people want to follow you off the cliff? And we do so much work on personalizing for our customers, right? I mean, data, segmentation. I hate when people ask me what my management style is because short of- It depends on the person. Exactly, right? They're so all our children. Yeah, so special flowers. <laughs> exactly. But short of, you know, like all of us do, set a clear vision and, you know, really support your team, my management style flexes with every person I work for, right? Because this war for talent now is not just about beauty company versus beauty company. We're all probably looking for the same types of employees, regardless of what you're selling. So I use, and you can use any sort of framework. I think a framework is important because it anchors you to some swim lanes, but I use Myers Briggs and I try to create environments where people, are not only at their best, but they enjoy the way we work together. So without going into the whole framework, but something as simple as the introvert extrovert, it's not a judgment on your social skills. It's where you get your energy from. So if somebody's a big extrovert, we do war rooms, we whiteboard together, we spend hours cranking out an idea. If somebody's an introvert that gets their energy from being alone or in really small groups, that's the worst torture possible for them. So I give them an idea. And I go, go think about it for a couple of days and then pop back in when you have something to talk about. Or the judges and perceivers. Judges are taskmasters. They do great with timelines. So I'm a judger, so you know, I've got timelines and when other people who work for me are judges, we work really well together. If you're a perceiver who kind of just, you know, saves things to the last minute, kind of hits with bouts of in inspiration, me being a timeline taskmaster is the worst possible work environment for you. So then I have to create moments where, hey, this is a three-month project, we're gonna have updates every couple weeks. The last month, we've got something every week. And then the last two weeks, we're together every other day. They know what's coming. They know how to plan around that. If they want to do nothing until that two-week checkpoint and do everything the night before, and that, that's their best work, and that's where they're most happy, I have to work with that. So I think about you know incentives, yes, about the bonus structures and things are great. But if you're not letting their, your people be their best and in a way that they want to work, then you're, that's, I think, just as important as the bonus. You get people who leave even with massive bonuses. We didn't share, we didn't prep too much ahead of time. And we do the same thing. We use whole brain, which is a color wheel. So I know who's a yellow, a green, a blue, yeah. and a red. And I also know where they go in stress. So my 
personal story is that I'm a blue green, which is really logical and organized. But when I get stressed, I go and have all these feelings, which is in yeah. the red category. <laughs> and I'm you too. I know. Oh, that's why we got along like, so also, well. I love this. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so going through those corny, you know, might feel corny, but really under deeply understanding the um, audience with which your team is deeply personal stuff about them and is helpful, very so, helpful. So one of the, it's, we didn't talk about this, but one of the amazing things in that, people think this is fluffy, right? But it's really important. I remember I had a group once, they were all Reds, so we're all the same. So we'd go to meetings and we'd uh, talk and we'd, everyone would be motivated, the meetings would be really quick, everyone would agree. And then we couldn't understand why everyone else in the organisation hated us. And it was because we were all the same type of person and this plays to a diversity play for me. And, and the issue was we were fine as a group, but we were very narrow in our thinking. We weren't actually bringing the best ideas. And you talk about innovation. We weren't bringing the best ideas to the forefront. So we actively then sought out either to replace people in time in the organisation with those other characteristics. So you brought that diversity of thought into the group. Or if you didn't have it, then go and seek out those different characteristics or diversity of thought in the rest of the organisation. Now, it makes it a far more painful discussion, but the results are so much better by the, by the uh, end of the discussion um, that it's really worth it. And, and we just grew tremendously. So it was about building that framework that's safe to have the constructive mm -hmm. feedback and build because it's a team sport and it's to improve the team and then making sure you had the right diversity of thought in the organisation whether that be gender, race, age, whatever, mm -hmm. or, or personality type, yep. whatever that was. And that really, <laughs> to me, makes a big difference. So it's a lot of work to get it right, but once you get it right, the results really fly. Yeah, lo love that you guys, uh, we didn't re talked about Sorry, this before. Yeah, but no, but no, but, that's, <laughs> but, it, but I love that you guys actually talked about this because like it's, uh, it's just uh, we're just fooling ourselves. We think we, we know where we're going. Like uh, as I said, like, I think the biggest problem that we're, we're facing is like it, it's, the the world is becoming more and more unpredictable. As we, we nobody knows what's uh, what's gonna be in one year, not even two or three, right? So, and uh, if we're fooling ourselves, just trying to you know uh, appear that we know everything, then we we we've don't show our vulnerabilities and. Uh, that we also have to learn with each other, and that's that's what will make the difference. Actually, how fast we learn and how we learn with each other that, as a team. Right? So uh, that's uh, I love it. Love yeah. that uh, that uh, that you guys brought it up. So write that down. <laughs> so it's okay to be vulnerable to you know to to show that you don't know everything. That uh, that's probably one of the best ways to actually can open the door for getting help. Yeah, and I'd say if your company is not doing something like we've talked about. It's so okay to go to your boss or the person that's grading your homework to say, here's how I would like to work. This is how I'm going to be successful. And set that for yourself. Because I, I'm glad that we're doing it at our companies, but I've worked in places where that wasn't happening and um, wish I would have had the courage and sort of gumption to have gone to many a boss and say, that's not going to work for me. And if you want the best performance out of me, here's how it's going to happen. It takes a lot of work, and it is painful, I agree. But it's not just for managing your teams, right? It's actually how you sell in ideas to other people, your peers and your customers and your executives. So even thinking about, is somebody an idea person or are they a data person? And if I'm talking to an idea person, they don't want to sit through 50 slides before we get to answer last, right? So I give them the idea and then let them ask questions, and I jump between slide 23 and 49 and 12. Somebody's a data person, I'm answer last, right? I create a bread trail of crumbs and I lead them to the answer. Half of it's the idea, half of it is how you sell it. So it has so many broader applications between just managing your team, which to be honest, not everyone puts the same emphasis on. But if you really need to anchor it around a much broader perspective, it's so effective in selling ideas to everyone else around you and then understanding your customers. Mm -hmm. I had a great, a great example of a data-driven person. And we we're going through this meeting and so forth, and she was freaking out in the meeting because she goes, "What's the agenda? What's, where are we? What are we doing? All the rest of it." And the facilitator of the meeting picked up a piece of. I hope she's not listening to this because she'll be she'll be angry at me. <laughs> but he picked up a piece of paper and it just had words on it. it. Goes, "Here's the agenda," and immediately she went, "Oh," and relaxed. Now the paper had nothing to do with the meeting. But <laughs> as long as 
as long as there was, she felt that there yeah. was a sequence a to work the data person oh, and the structure, it was good. And so I think your point, Fawn, is really good that you've got to drive to each individual's needs and make sure you're accommodating that. Cool. So uh, definitely, like, it's, it's good management practices, right? So adapt to the, to the people that you're working with. So can, can we get into what do you think, like, a, but we, we have to work, probably work differently, empower people. That's what a lot of people thought. We have to be able to empower people and get your teams motivated. And, and they are the ones that actually are seeing what their customers, that they're dealing with the customers. So if they don't have the, the power and the initiative to come back with the ideas and, the, and, and their feedback to where we actually have to reorient and, and, and respond, right? Then we will probably not know what's going on and you'll probably be losing relevance, right? So how techniques to actually to empower people, how to actually have worked in, in, in your environments to give them voice, to, 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 to empower them to, to bring ideas? In a, is, there, is there any techniques or tactics or, uh, or ways to do it? Or is it just like a you have to do inspiration from, yeah. the, from the heavens? I mean, it totally depends on the organization. We have hackathons, that's very common at product and engineering-based organizations. Um, we have, a, again, a moment in time where we have all hands that are cross-functional, not the company meeting, but to say, here are some problems we're dealing with and give people time to sit with those problems and come back and see if they have solutions. Um, you know, so like giving visibility of the problems. Right? Yeah, I, I think people love a challenge. Like we all love, like, I'm such an escape room junkie. I don't know if there are any other escape room junkies yeah. out there, but I'm a total nerd. And um, I'm wired like that. I tend to attract teams that are wired like that. And so I'm just really open with, here's what I'm struggling with in my role and things that I know I need to solve. And you guys are a part of my team and let's sit with it for a week, but it's more fluid. I don't know, know if there's necessarily like some proven tactic or if someone has one, great, but I think it's just this openness and I am one of you and here's what we're up against. I want people to be in the shower, on a commute and be like, oh my God, I remember Lizzie was saying X, Y, and Z. I think this could help with that. And I wanna make sure I'm giving enough information to where that's happening just naturally, all the time. Oh, but that's a technique right there. It's transparency and visibility, which is not, uh, for the yeah. people who don't know, ten, more than 10,000 corporations here, it's not a very common. I was on a panel yesterday or the day before, I can't remember now, Westworld in the middle, um, where a woman who runs Workplace at Facebook, it's the tool that's yes. their Workplace tool, was saying that much of the advice that they give to business leadership is, don't think about the information that you, you have all this information, right? And don't think about what should I tell my employees. Just focus on what you shouldn't tell them. Because it's usually a much smaller percentage of things that you know are really important that are insider information or things, you know, proprietary information that your team can't have, confidential. And then you end up being probably pretty good about pushing enough out there for them to be active in the solution, the solutioning of the business. Yeah, I just recently left my last role, and I'm still close with my team as if we're friends. And it doesn't mean that, you know, when I was their boss, we went on vacation together. There's certain, you know, I think in startups, I think life is a little different. In big corporations, there's still levels of appropriateness, right? So, But the fact that we're all still friends and we hang out after says a lot about the culture and how we respected each other as individuals and as teammates versus a hierarchy, even if it's imposed by a corporation. Um, my team was super diverse. Like, you know, you guys are lucky where maybe you have like everyone who's like you. My team was so different. The E's, the I's, the J's. Like there was nothing in common with how people work together. And I inherited the team so I can see why maybe there's some, you know, friction before. But the one thing we did was created a sub vision for our team. Obviously our company had our goals. We had numbers to hit. We knew where our brand wanted to go. But we work in digital and beauty. And my personal crusade, which became theirs, regardless of what personality type they were, we believed in the same division. Because it was so prevalent, it made it really easy to empower people. Because not only are we all on the same page, I could trust that any decision they made was based on that true north. So for me, beauty was always really too narrowly defined by what we see on TV and in magazines, right? It's a very monochromatic vision of what a beauty person looks like. But digital and, and social- And it's not me. Oh, maybe. It I don't know. You. We should talk. We should, you know, go to the green room and play around with some products. But um, that's exactly, no, Bruno, but this is actually where I'm going because I think that with digital, 
we've been able to democratize what beauty looks like. You can be any size, shape, color, gender, orientation, political belief. It doesn't matter. Digital and social now allows everyone to take part in this beauty conversation, to say they're beautiful, to really, truly, finally make beauty around self-love and empowerment. That's something we couldn't do with traditional media up until this stage. So if you're on my team, it doesn't matter how you work, you're a night person, a morning person, if you're shy or if you're outgoing, if you believe in this core tenet that my little teamlet out of this whole company and whole industry is trying to do, then we're true north, so I can feel comfortable that when they're on social media handling different crises that come up, when they're creating content or they're in the markets with all of the different teams, because I can't be in 50 countries myself, if we're all on that true north mission and everything somewhat falls into it and they trust me to pick up the phone and be like, I don't know what to do here and they don't feel stupid if I, you know, they have to call and ask for help, that's how you create empowerment and alignment. And it's not really a tactic, but if everyone believes in the same mission, then you, you're more comfortable giving empowerment, they're more comfortable following and your vision and, ask, yeah, and asking for help. What a 93-year-old company has to tell us, has to teach us. Um, I, I think as we think about innovation is making sure you give multiple tools. I don't think there's a recipe to innovation at all. I think it's making sure you give um, the people in the organisation multiple ways to approach this. And some of that is free time to go and think about their current job and what they're doing. And is there better ways to solve their problems? Um, social interaction or team interaction, um, crowdsourcing, we do a lot of that. We have structured programs of you know, 10 steps to help you work through an innovation process. So I, and I think they're all important. So what we, we try to do is we actually have a, a center of excellence for innovation, which isn't responsible for any innovation, but it's meant to give them some, all of our, uh, our people in our company some tools to actually think about, and there's lots of them out there, but all those tools available to them to think through how they want to solve a problem. The, the other thing that we did, I think, that made a big difference was when we started this, we said, let's, let's, let's be more innovative than we are today. That's a hard word to say. And, uh, and I think that there's a danger in that that you can then free up time to think about anything. And we're... We're not in the business of making ice cream or whatever, right? So we make heavy industrial equipment and, and uh, try to build a better world through better living standards. And as you do that, you've got to, you've got to frame the, the need. And once you frame the need and then give the people the tools, then let them go. And then get, get out of their way and help them, help them use those tools to, uh, to come up with great ideas. So I think framing, framing and then giving tools is really important. Really cool. Lizzie, what about we, we, you tell us a little bit of a, you're, you're, you came from the traditional industry, CBS, Universal, and then we went to a startup, mm -hmm. right? So what actually attracts you to go there? Like what, what are the, the traces that your leadership had without mentioning names at, at CBS that you didn't like? that attract you to go to a digital native company? And, and, and what do you like there? Like, just trying to kind of, a, what, a, what, a, what is, what, what do you, we can predict here? Where, where, where's leadership going in the next 10 years and in this next zeitgeist that you mentioned here, right? So like, uh, things are changing and, and very rapidly. What, what are the no, no things that leadership does today that have to kind of, to change? And, you know, it's, um it's Without fun. mentioning names, I guess. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I think it's, it's funny because just recently I was talking to the head of recruiting at one of the big media companies. And he was calling me saying, I have this open search, and I know you'll never move to New York because you're an L.A. girl and you'd be perfect, but who do you think? And I said, I really don't want to recommend anybody to you because I don't believe your leadership has the guts to do what it's going to take to change. And I think it's, it's not big co versus small co and, oh, I love the startup experience. It's that I love leadership that has guts, that has the guts to follow the consumer, that has the stomach to believe in the data and do something about it, regardless of how hard it is. And so um, if there's a big co out there that the leadership at the top believes the change is so significant and that they've got to 
completely pivot their business, which is very hard to do and very expensive sometimes, um, then I'd work there. And I'm not looking to go work anywhere else, but I would work there. So it's not about the size of company. It's just about that um, energy. Does that make sense? You mean like the appetite for yeah. taking the risks and, uh, and, yeah. and, and, and yeah. do the right thing? Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not always the, you know, do the right thing. I yes. mean, it's just that. What do you think it is? Um, it, it, again, it always goes back to the customer. And when the customer is leaving and you're still sitting there saying this worked for 40 years, why don't we just keep making it work? I have no interest in even being in the same room with you. Like, we're not getting a beer. <laughs> I agree with that. Um, there was a company that came calling a luxury conglomerate with some of the brands that we would all aspire to own, let alone work for. So when I got the call, I was really, really excited. Had to sit down with HR and was talking about some of the digital transformation work I'm doing. And now I've just spent all this time telling you guys that I was trying to be collaborative, treat my peers as my clients, et cetera. And as I was saying this, and you know, it's an art. I, I would say I'd spend 70 to 80% of my time educating and collaborating and the rest of it doing work, which is not good. Don't tell your manager that. But you know, so much of it is building relationships. And even though I thought I'd done a fairly good job with it, the interviewer at one point stops me and says, does anyone at work like you? Do you have any friends at work? And it broke my heart because I actually think I work really hard at that, right? Whether it's my peers or my team. But the fact that this company thought that what I was doing was completely breaking their fabric and culture, whereas they're actually, with as many of the great brands as they have, really far behind and failing. I mean, there are companies, that, luxury companies and jewelry companies that said they would never, ever sell anything online because they're too prestigious of a brand. And now you see them selling $40,000 pieces of jewelry online and people actually occasionally buying them. The times are changing, right? And if this company and HR is telling me I'm too disruptive for them, I am not a fit no matter how much I want to work on those brands, get some free swag, you know, or just really tap into those consumers that are changing and what an incredible opportunity to up-level a company. If they think that I have no friends at work and I'm too disruptive, they're never going to like working with me and vice versa. So I think that part of this process is not just the age old, hey, can I, how do I get this job? It's how do I figure out if this is a fit for me with the people and the leadership's guts? I fully agree with that. Yeah, we should short that stock. <laughs> it's kind of um, doing its own thing right now, so we might be all right. But. Rob, do you, you have a vision of what, what's, what are the no no's and like what, what has to change? And then, um, or or what, what, what doesn't have to change? What has to stay there? To, to, to so, so I think there's a couple of different things. It was interesting, we indirect um, with startups and third parties as well as our own company. Um, I think the true north is always your customer. It's always your customer. And you've got to not just do what the customer wants, but think about where the customer's going and how do you make it a better and more convenient and more value-adding um, proposition than they've had before. Um, so I think, I think that has to take precedence over everything else. And that doesn't mean you have to change everything, it just means you've got to make sure you know where they're heading and make sure you're with them. Um, having said that, the difficulty is what has been successful in the past and what is successful in the future may be different things. And they may be the same thing. So I've, I've read books that, management books that say, you know, the reason we're successful after 50 years is because we stuck to the things we're good at. Oh, the sacred cow. Right, and then you pick up the other one that says the reason we're really good is because we got rid of those sacred cows and we did everything different. And you read these two and go, which one? Yeah. <laughs> and and they both can be right and they both are wrong, right? So I think change for the sake of change is not good. I think uh, staying the same for the sake of staying the same is not good either. So it has to be about delivering the best value for the customer. Now, the interesting thing for me is regardless of the business you're in, um, the needs of a customer and the way a customer, any customer lives their life is changing. So you've We've all seen the little 18-month-year-old with the iPad that, sorry, a tablet. For, <laughs> uh, a tablet that's swiping a tablet, okay? And, and you say that is a natural behaviour and you have to accommodate those changes in life. So you have to make changes and you have to um, move forward. As you said, online um, purchases in some countries even today is not heard of, but in other countries you say, I don't do it any other way. So we just got to keep uh, evolving, but not for the sake of the evolution itself. Now that can be really radical. It can be really radical. Um, 
but only if the customer's going to follow you there. So. Cool. Yes, sir. Uh, Pam. <laughs> so you guys wanted to join me asking questions to those uh, three brilliant minds. So like, please use the mic there. We have a few minutes. Can you just use the mic, please? Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you guys. This has been eye-opening and quite interesting. Um, I've been to a lot of panels, but I'm genuinely curious for you three, what's the last book or the current book you're reading? I feel like you have a lot of great information and, and I'm sure it comes from a lot of different sources, but uh, curious what your reading list looks like. Mine's biased. I'm reading Shoe Dog. Right. <laughs> yeah. And it is you better awesome, read that one. guys. I'm doing it obviously because of work, but when I pulled this, so I just, Took a little hiatus between jobs, um, spent time in Nepal, Everest Space Camp. I just climbed Kilimanjaro. I dragged that book all the way up to the summit of Kilimanjaro <laughs> and back down. It was so good I couldn't put it down. Um, you talk about building a company, but you talk about humanity and feelings and emotions, right? And that's what makes us human. And that's what I think that I mean, I'm underlining so many quotes in that book because it just reminds me to just like you were saying, know your customer, right? And one of these quotes by Henry Ford I love. It's like, if I just only listen to my customer, they just want faster horses. So it's not just listening, it's then trying to interpret and anticipate what we don't even know yet. And so when you bring it back to the humanity of people and understanding what it feels like to get up on a cold gray morning at 6 a.m. when it's still dark and put your running shoes on and go for a run, or trying to democratize athleticism, right, and thinking about not just elite athletes, but if you have a body, you can be an athlete. How do we tap into that inspiration and that emotion of people? I'm enjoying this read, and it's so not a plug for my job. I'm just loving this book that I carried it to a summit. So that's been really good for me. Are you want me to go? Oh, we, don't, we don't read in Australia. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to tell them I'm not no. reading. So, um, I, I haven't read any books that really stand out recently, but I, I would say Malcolm Gladwell always is astounding to me because I love things where you make observations about behaviour and what causes that behaviour. So, uh, in general, I've seen him speak a few times and I really enjoy reading his books. Um, I always like Good to Great because I like Level 5 <coughs> Humble Leadership. I think that's a, a critically important thing. And I haven't read it for a long time, so Please don't ask me anything about it anymore. But, yeah. um, but I always remember it was one of those books that I really found was important about how you should lead. So. I don't read a lot of business books. I try to escape. So okay. <laughs> I am Pilgrim. Love it, if you haven't read that. Um, but I'd say it from a business book standpoint, The Goal, which is a very old book that oh, talks, yes. I know, The Goal. Oh God, I I've reread it a bunch of times because it talks about, you know, bottlenecking and sort of some cool. things to be looking for if you're a business leader. Everybody needs to read Ready Player One if you have not read that before the movie comes out. It's amazing, plugging that. I have two to recommend. There's The Startup Way mm -hmm. from Eric Ries. I think it's a very, very, uh, uh, align what we're talking here, how, how to implement an experimentation culture inside your company without breaking it, like a gradually uh, kind of making, you know, a, the startup way. The startup, startup way. way. Eric Ries. So the, how to get into experimentation gradually and making the experiments small, cheap, so creating the, the spaces for failure or actually, because, you know, if you fail big, you're just going to be fired, right? Now, right? So, but how you actually create a space is small. There's a, 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 whole, a whole structure around how to do this in terms of funding, funding small experiments, and let them evolve, and uh, how to, to measure progress. So it's, I, I think it's a very practical reading that I, I ties uh, back to this new culture of uh, innovation very well. The other one is really cool. It's less about humans. It's more like a, the math. Of a, of a massive change, which is uh, uh, anti-fragile from Nassim Taleb. This is really cool. It's like how to take advantage of massive changes. And uh, it's really, really cool. So it's. Yeah. I read less books. I do a lot of snackable articles and digital content because I'm digital and I have a short intention span. Um, I feel the current is pretty good. They actually do a lot of 
really up and coming. Like that's how I found out De Beers is using blockchain to authenticate their diamonds and make sure they're conflict free. I'm like, how do I do that with my supply chain and my collectible sneakers? And you know, L2, it's a um, digital consultancy that talks about the, the digital IQ of brands. That's interesting because they always serve up really interesting anecdotes and examples. I think rankings are kind of tough. It's kind of like the US News and World Report school rankings. I think if you're in the top 15 or 20 schools in the country, you're a good school, right? It doesn't matter if you're one or three that year. But they give really interesting examples of what brands are doing in the digital space that I'm like, oh, they did this activation here and there. Um, and then like even things like women in retail, I get all my stuff from newsletters. I skim. And if I like an article, I double click. Um, but that helps me day to day just really get the skinny on the news. Like the current's latest article was, is South by still about digital and tech or is it about big brands now? And that's on my list to read on the plane because I think it's kind of edging the other direction. But it makes me more aware that if I do want to come do an activation as a startup or as a brand, what does the ecosystem look like next year? All right. Thank you so much for that long list of book recommendations. And I love L2. I read. I watch their videos every single week. I'm obsessed with Scott Galloway. Um, really great advice on this panel. Two quick questions, hopefully. The first one, I work at an ad agency, one of the global holding companies. And a lot of times, you have to collaborate with other agencies, other offices, and they all have their own P&L. But we have to service one client. I'm sure you find similar situations in your organizations. How do you get the leaders of those different partners to be less, I guess, territorial and to see that we're all charging toward the same goal and eventually the money's going to the same place. Mm -hmm. And then question number two is what piece of leadership advice would you have for a lot of the young people in the room that eventually would like to join your ranks one day in their own organizations? Thank you. Let's take that. God, we could be here all day with that answer. Yeah. You get um, answer. I think from the holding company standpoint, like don't assume you actually are all working towards the same goal. <laughs> So I actually think it's really important. We've talked about planning in a couple different places. And it's OK to call a timeout on a project and say, we are not aligned. Like, this is not moving forward in a way where I feel like we're going to have a great outcome for our client. And I think we need to talk about that. And there might, there's not always a solution to that if you can't get alignment. But don't waste your time when you can't. And engage your boss and engage your leadership. It can be scary to do that, but it's really the best thing to do. Um, the second question was, leadership oh, leadership advice. advice. Um, you know, planned, like, take your curiosity, put some planning behind it, and then, and then go. Don't be scared. But don't just be, I have an idea, I have an idea, with nothing to back it up. And as you get an idea, go gain consensus from friends and peers so that by the time, um, and you can do that quickly. There's a rapid way to do that. I'm not saying you build a 50-page deck. Um, I wish I would have known that sooner, because it's a really simple way to just move up in the organization. The best way to get a raise is just to start doing that next job. The best way to get the promotion is just to start showing that you're capable of um, facilitating what it takes at that next level. So that's what I've done. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just want to go to the second question. And I want to, I agree uh, with Lizzie. I think one of the things um, for people to succeed is you. You collaborate and you lead by doing, right? And it doesn't, it, it's easy. At the, it's easy for me now to say this and you go, yeah, yeah, but you've been through some of that, right? But if I, I think the real key to success is see the opportunity you've got, don't worry about hierarchy. And, and you have to respect hierarchy, but you don't, you don't have to let that get in the way of collaborating across the organisation and achieving great results. And people that, I think we miss sometimes people, the art of good leadership still is great collaboration. And if you can't collaborate and you can't build consensus and energy in an organisation at any level, you can't lead. I don't, that's my personal belief. You've got to be able to do that. And I worry sometimes that we're losing some of that art of collaboration um, and working with people and driving ideas and energising people regardless of the level of the organisation. Do not under so I'll be done. Do not underestimate the value of can I grab coffee in fifteen minutes with you? Yep. Like everybody has time for a coffee. Just keep it to fifteen minutes, and you'll be amazed at how you can maneuver through organizations and find a way to drive success. I agree. Collaboration is important, and it used to be that if you can't play in the corporate environment, go start your own thing. But if you're successful at starting your own thing, you're going to grow. And no one wants to work for a tyrant. So you have to learn that skill set at some point, unless you just want to be a one-person business for the whole rest of your life. So I think that's really important. 
to your first question, one thing tactically that I did because um, I had different agencies creating content, I used to be a management consultant at Bain before all this digital transformation work. And I hate slides now, I hate overused tools, but one thing that was really important is I had a global agency of record creating all my offline content and we hired a digital agency to do this digital snackable stuff because sometimes you're not great at both. And I was really clear on a racy chart who owns what, right? Like if it's a global campaign, then the driver is the global AOR. If it's a digital only campaign because it's a bronze launch, it's a product that's only going in a few markets or it's not going to get big media dollars behind it, then the digital agency of record owns it. We're all at the table, but different people take different leads at different times. And I set that up really early in the beginning, and it doesn't mean that we didn't change it and pivot as we went, but it was really clear from the beginning which person. Was it global marketing who leads this launch or the digital team that leads this launch? And so there was no weird expectations or people feeling like their job had been taken because we'd set up front who owned what, but we were all at the table and there was a lot of transparency. Your second question about leadership. Sometimes the best doers are not the best leaders. And it takes actually an incredible amount of work to grow into a leader. And somewhere in the middle of your career, you hit an inflection point where you do less and you lead more. Less of your time is about spreadsheets and PowerPoints and things like that. And more of your time is about thinking about strategies and visions and how you manage your team. And if you don't start flexing those muscles actively, to get a promotion overnight and to be expected to be great at leading is really, really hard. So grab the coffees, you know, build collaborative relationships to learn how you start doing that and ask people, what's the skill you use? How do you do it? Think about who the great leaders are that you really like working for. What do they do well? Because if you get that promotion and then you start thinking about it, it's going to be a world of hurt because when you're sandwiched in the middle, you still have to do and you have to lead. That's the hardest part of your career, right? I'm going to tell you, like, when you come up on the other side of it, it gets a little easier because you're not then doing all the heavy lifting. You get to guide and lead, and it's really fun. But that middle point where you get that first big promotion, you still have to do both. And hopefully you've prepped for it along the way by thinking about how you collaborate and using different skill sets and tools that we talked about because it'll be easier to flex that muscle. But to start running a marathon when you've never even jogged, it's really painful. I would like to interject on the collaboration just to give you a little bit more color. Just try to give more than you ask for in return. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just create, create more value for people than we're waiting them to give back. Just, just that. Just. That, that's the way to create the alliances and the, and, the, and the collaboration with other people. Just give everything you have. Don't expect nothing in return. And last question? Yep. No, to, to kill it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. <laughs> that was amazing. I just want to let you guys Except know. Um, if you have questions for the panel, if you guys can just take them out in the lounge so we can prep and get ready for the next yeah. session. Okay. And we'll bring the panelists over to the lounge. You can talk with them then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.